Welcome everyone, everyone here and everyone online to the weekly SETI Institute colloquia, or talks I guess I should say. Um, we do this every week uh, for our own staff, for our friends at Ames, for people from Silicon Valley, and for those who will watch live or will look at the webcast later, and you're all very welcome. Today, it's my privilege to introduce a neat guy, Brian Travis from Los Alamos, the, the Computational Earth Science Group. Technically, he's actually retired from Los Alamos, uh, but he still works there and is involved in studies associated with Mars and other places that have liquid water in the solar system. Um, he tells me that he became inspired by working on Apollo. He doesn't look that old, but he actually worked at Huntsville on the, uh, the development of the, of the spacecraft and on the dynamics of the orbits. Uh, his background is in computational fluid dynamics, so he was able to work on the very tricky issues of fuel sloshing in tanks of rockets. Um, and so he then went, went back to school and got a PhD in Florida and worked most of his career at Los Alamos. He's doing cool stuff now. I am sure the things he did at Los Alamos that he doesn't want to talk about were cool too. But for us, we're fascinated to know about his research on ice and brines in the Martian subsurface and other cold places in the solar system. Brian Travis. Thank you, Thank you David. Um, yeah, it was really a blast working for Apollo on a man-to-the-moon mission. Uh, I had a pretty neat job, but my brother had a really, really cool job. He got to program the, the computer on the lunar lander and teach the astronauts how to use it. I thought, man, <laughs> I sure wish I had that job. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, when the bottom fell out of the space program, a few years after that, I went off to graduate school and applied math and fluid dynamics, and uh, went out to Los Alamos, and basically we've been working in hydrology. Um, let's see if I can. And um, subsurface hydrology, <coughs> which is basically the science of fluid flow in soils and rocks, and um, it encompasses a great range of, of processes and physics and thermodynamics from just sort of simple groundwater flow to Vado zone flow, which is the unsaturated zone above the water table, to uh, hydrothermal zones, fracture flow, transport of contaminants, and ge geochemistry. And we get into microbial activity uh, <coughs> for a number of the uh, in situ remediation projects that I've worked on over the years. And um, I got into hydrology and the water science basically because that's fundamental to society. Everybody needs water and the equations that describe these processes also apply pretty much to oil. So that pretty much covers it. Water and energy. Um, <coughs> I figured I'd be fairly safe job wise with that kind of a background and it seemed to have worked out. Um, Well, actually, the modern era of groundwater hydrology or subsurface hydrology started, uh, I think, in 1856 when Henry Darcy uh, published his report on the public fountains of the city of Dijon in France. And he did a lot of experiments on sand columns and water flow through the sand columns and came up with uh, the linear relationship between water flux and pressure gradient in a column of sand which is now famously known as Darcy's Law. Uh, from those humble beginnings, the science of hydrology has grown enormously. Uh, so now we're, we and others in the community are actually thinking we can model systems as complex as this. We have all sorts of surface processes, rivers, streams, precipitation, subsurface dynamics, uh, besides just you know simple water flow to uh, <coughs> geochemical, biological, and uh, ecological factors 
And in some ways, the computational modeling, which is basically what I'm involved in, uh, tends to get ahead of the observational and, and measurement science. Um, you know, it's expensive and time consuming to go out and measure things in the field. And we need lots of data. And uh, so we're always pushing the experimentalists who think that we don't know anything because all we do is just compute. Um, but anyway. Okay, so how did I get back into Mars? Um, <coughs> well, I heard a talk by Vic Baker, who's a professor of, at University of Arizona. He came to the lab and uh, gave a talk on some of his work on early Mars. And it really just astonished me that you know, he talked about the possibility that there were oceans and even or lakes, maybe even ocean on Mars in its early history. And um, so I decided, well, actually, we've done a lot of, we have a lot of computational modeling capability at the lab. Uh, maybe we could use that to, to study some of these issues. Because for me, the issue was, OK, you have all this water that flooded Mars <coughs> from the Valles Marineros, this huge fracture that opened up, and water came out, flooded over the northern plains. Uh, <coughs> some of that water was lost to space from meteor impacts. Some of it is locked up in the polar caps. A little bit of it's in the atmosphere. A lot of it, most people estimate, is in the subsurface somewhere. Uh, there's probably a cryosphere. In other words, it's, since the surface is so cold, a lot of the water is present as ice um, in the northern and southern latitudes, away from the equatorial zone. <coughs> but some of it could be liquid below, below the, uh, the frozen cryosphere. And uh, so after a lot of reading and trying to catch up with what other people were doing, we started to uh, build some models that we thought would be appropriate for Mars. <coughs> and there's actually lots of evidence for water activity on Mars, um, necessarily surface expressions from Valley Networks, uh, which Virginia Gulick did some nice modeling work on back late 90s. I think she's one of your scientists here. Um, <coughs> and um, pingos and rootless cones and other um, structures that, that, Im Im that imply water. And then recently, a uh, burn and all found uh, actually ice exposed a couple meters, one to two meters below the surface in some recently formed craters. And there's you know, hyd some hydro a few hydrothermal systems, I think, have been identified and, and other uh, expressions of water activity. Probably not as intense as what may have formed lakes and oceans in early days, but nevertheless, appears to be a fair amount of water still locked up in, in Mars. Um, also, salts. Um, have been identified on the surface. Here's this color-coded image um, <coughs> published a few years ago showing what are believed to be fairly large uh, chloride salt deposits. Other salts have been identified on the surface, ferric chlorides, magnesium sulfates, calcium chloride, other salts. Um, <coughs> And these are important because they also indicate, by and large, uh, water activity. Um, for example, the, the Martian Nakla meteorites has a lot of brines in the, in the fractures of the, uh, inside the meteorite, containing brines. Um, <coughs> so there was water flow or, or briny flow within those meteorites, which came from Mars, which is actually something else that kind of blew me away when I first discovered that. We have Meteorites from Mars, you know, on the Earth, but sure enough, um, they get blown off by meteor strikes on Mars and they drift around in space and eventually make their way to, to Earth. And they were found, I think, in Antarctica. <coughs> Not all are from Antarctica. Not close from Egypt, if I remember correctly. Egypt? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. And I guess it's from isotopic signatures that they know it's from yeah. Mars. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. Um, <coughs> now, the presence of salts in water is pretty important uh, from my perspective because uh, 
it lowers the freezing point, in some cases dramatically. I mean, liquid water, pure water, wouldn't be able to survive on the surface of Mars because it's too cold. But if you have salt in the water, that's a different story. Sodium chloride has a eutectic point of minus 22 centigrade. Calcium chloride is about minus 52. Ferric chloride is about minus 70. So there are salts that have very low eutectic points. That's the point at which you can still have a, a solution of water and salt. <coughs> and so if you had salty solutions flowing on the surface, that's, that's not violating any thermodynamics particularly. I tend to just look at this side. I, sorry, I don't mean to neglect you over here, but. Uh, <clears throat> okay, before I got into my own numerical modeling, I took a look at what other people had done. There, there's a fair amount of work that had been done over the years on uh, magma intrusions and how they might generate hydrothermal systems on Mars. And, um, and the outflows could, could be involved in valley networks or fluvial network uh, systems. And giant polygons, uh, impact craters are obviously a favorite uh, subject for, because of all the energy that they put into the surface and you would melt ice and, and have a hydrothermal system going at least for a while. But generally these models did not have any, um, either didn't have an ice phase or they didn't have salt, which is pretty important. Um, so that was basically what, what I added to it. I built a model that's going to have allows water to change from liquid to, um, to the ice phase and also include the transport of salt and uh, its impact on fluid dynamics. And on Earth, actually a lot of the research that's been done on flow and permeable media has been in sea ice. The sea ice um, gets a little bit of salt entrained in the bottom part of it, in the bottom layers. <coughs> And sea ice actually is permeable. You may think it's just solid ice, but it isn't. It's, it uh, has low porosity and permeability. And there's been a number of studies, both uh, analytical and numerical and experimental on formation or the dynamics of uh, brines flowing in sea ice. And that provides some of the uh, testing that we can do for our own numerical models even though you think, well, that's sea ice and we're talking about Mars, but mathematically they're equivalent systems. Okay, and since I'm a mathematician, I need to put in a plug here for the value of, of models. Um, <coughs> you know, it used to be models could be fairly simple mathematically and you could actually get an answer and, <laughs> but now, models tend to get more complex and we need computers to, to solve the, equa the uh, equations. But anyway, models, in my mind, tie together what we know about a system into a single framework. And uh, they allow you to test the consistency of conceptual models um, and determine whether they're really sensible or not, especially when they're subject to conservation laws, like conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. Those are pretty fundamental. Uh, restrictions that any system should obey, and other constraints like equations of state for, for water or, or brines. <coughs> and of course a favorite uh, use for models is for sensitivity studies to rank the various factors in order of importance. And also they provide an explanation or a, a way of, to explain a set of observational data or experimental data. And then finally, or maybe not finally, but in addition, um, if you have a, a model that you think is pretty, pretty good and it maybe matches some experimental data in the lab and maybe even some field data, um, you can use it to estimate the behavior of some system into the future under various conditions. But of course, there's always caveats there. Um, <coughs> Okay, the, the model I developed for Mars is called Magnum, and it was a little uh, grandiose in, in its terms of its name. I didn't actually name it, because I'm terrible with naming things. 
Um, actually, our program manager at the lab named it because <laughs> he wanted to, came up with this Mars Global Hydrology Numerical Model because he wanted to be the Magnum PI. <laughs> 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 so I said, okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's broadened out to um, be, be useful for many other applications besides Mars that maybe I'll have time to talk about. Uh, it's, basic, it's based on uh, mass and energy conservation laws. And the momentum equations are solved in a, in a reduced form in Darcy's law. Darcy's law basically is momentum conservation in a porous medium for low Reynolds number. Um, <coughs> but actually, since I had some idea that I might be using this for other applications, um, because while I was looking at Mars, I was reading up also about Europa and Enceladus. And um, so I have a, actually kind of a whole planet model we have momentum equations, Darcy's law in soil and rock and in the um, subsurface, but um, we also allow for an ocean. And we solve a simplified, or well, not, not that simplified, but steady incompressible Navier-Stokes equations in an ocean layer. And then we have, we allow for an ice shell in which uh, convection is parameterized. <coughs> Um, and it's a, it can operate in uh, one, two, or three three-dimensional coordinates, uh, Cartesian, cylindrical, or spherical geometries, and time, and also uh, has a salt transport capability. And in, in the <coughs> in the ice shell, which isn't of any particular uh, concern for Mars, but for uh, some of the applications and. Europa and Enceladus, um, you know, we have the tidal dissipative heating model in the shell, which can either be constant or episodic or a combination because it seems appropriate. And even a snow model, because uh, snow really has a very low thermal conductivity. If you get a layer of snow, for example, the stuff spraying out of the South Pole of Enceladus, you know, you're getting a little bit of snow on the, on the surrounding ground. Um, its thermal conductivity is probably quite low, and that affects the thermal evolution of the interior. So for Mars, we wouldn't worry about the uh, Navier-Stokes equation in an ocean layer or an ice shell. We just have the Darcy flow in the rock core plus energy transport and salt transport. And um, I don't know how much you know about numerical methods or modeling, but uh, and we have a lot of equations to solve and are solved sequentially. Take the momentum equation, Darcy's law, plug it into the mass conservation equation, and that gives one equation for pressure, which then is solved. When I have the pressure, then I can solve for the velocities. When I have the velocities, then I can solve, I can update energy and and mass transport. And then, <coughs> since it's actually quite a nonlinear problem, um, since particular here, the melt temperature can depend on concentration, which depends on temperature and, and mass of salt. It's pretty involved, and we end up with iterations inside iterations. But actually, it, it converges pretty fast, and uh, I've done some very long simulations with the model. I run it on a workstation, in case you're curious. <laughs> it's not a super. Is the salt model like a passive tracer with its own fusion properties? Right. Uh, there was a student, Jennifer Palguda, one of Jerry Schubert's students, who used the code and linked it up with Freak, which is a geochemistry code, to look at uh, dynamics and planetesimals and carbonaceous chondrites, asteroids, um, pretty daunting. That, that was parallelized because that's just a huge simulation. 
Okay, well, I guess at the time I sort of had convection on the brain because I had been working on um, processes in, in the subsurface that involve heat transport and that generally ends up with uh, convective processes. Um, and also looking at large-scale convective processes in the Earth, so-called mantle convection. So here on Mars, it seemed like uh, it would be a natural thing to expect that, uh, <coughs> you know, if you have a, a warm lower surface, a colder upper surface, and a fluid medium, that if the temperature difference is high enough, you'll start getting uh, motion in the fluid. And generally, the motion is either in form of rolls or in or plumes. And it, this so-called Rayleigh number helps characterize the uh, vigor of the convection. And this is fluid density, gravity, expansion coefficient of the fluid, temperature difference across the, the layer, the depth of the layer, and then the uh, thermal, conduct, or thermal diffusivity and the uh, viscosity of the fluid. So it's basically a, a measure of buoyancy or inertial forces to <coughs> diffusive forces or fluxes. And it's a, when you non-dimensionalize equations, you end up, I mean, the Rayleigh number always pops up and it's, um, <coughs> something that's tracked. When we're looking at a porous medium, um, is there a pointer? Oh, all right, all right, okay, gee, okay. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? <laughs> Getting old is a lot of fun. Um, oh, in a porous medium, <coughs> the uh, form of the Rayleigh number changes a bit. Um, <coughs> Now we have basically the same form, except uh, we have the permeability instead of uh, one of the, takes basically the place of H squared. And then in this case, we have a heat flux because in, um, for the Mars applications, we have some idea of the heat flux through the, uh, from the interior of the sur out to the surface, but we don't necessarily know what the temperature is at any particular depth. And so if we write the, uh, the, equations or scale them in terms of the heat flux, then the um, Rayleigh number takes a little different form. And a critical number, Rayleigh number in a porous medium is only about 40, whereas in a continuum, fluid continuum, it's quite a bit higher. But also in these systems, uh, this is sort of simplistic because alpha and mu and Rho are going to vary with the temperature. So you have to decide, well, am I going to define this based on average values or minimum or maximum values? <coughs> okay, and also in the Martian uh, regolith, which is basically the outer 10 kilometers of soil, which has been really pounded over the ages by meteor impacts, <coughs> the uh, permeability is expected to decrease with depth, be fairly permeable at the surface and have fairly high porosity, but then decay possibly exponentially with depth. With depth. Uh, Clifford uh, proposed a model something like this. Hannah and Phillips have a modification of it. They basically say, well, the permeability won't drop off as fast with depth as the Clifford model because of asperities and rock fractures that keep the fractures open. Anyway, we allow for a model like this also in the uh, regolith. Okay, my simplistic idea when I first got into this was, okay, we have a cryosphere, some part of the, the planet, and below that there could be liquid water. If we have heat flux and a permeable, a sufficiently permeable uh, regolith, then <coughs> the... Um, the water would probably flow, convect. 
and it might eat away at the ice. Instead of having a uniformly thick ice shell, you might have regions where it's thinned out, maybe thinned out quite a bit. That might be a mechanism for getting water, if it exists at depth, up close to the surface. Um, so some of the, fir the first set of simulations I did were just with pure water. And so these necessarily were looking at really deep systems. Because remember, the surface is like minus 60 degrees centigrade. <coughs> and what you're seeing here, um, it's turned out awfully yellow on the screen, are the, uh, is the liquid water, is the ice liquid water interface in these simulations. They're 10 kilometers on a side, because that's basically the depth of the regolith. Below 10 kilometers, the porosity is pretty much squeezed out or very, very low, and permeability is, should be very, very small. So you wouldn't have any or much fluid flow. <coughs> and so these are for five different uh, permeabilities. Um, you see you basically get a roll-type structure here and a plume here and another plume. Um, as the permeability go, goes up, the convection beca can become unsteady instead of just having uh, a plume that sits there and water is moving up the plume and then down out around it. The, the plumes can move around. Um, <coughs> well, this is kind of interesting, but these are all buried pretty deeply, you know, a few kilometers down. It'd be hard to, uh, to find them unless you had some super gravity uh, sensor, something better than GRACE, the GRACE satellites, probably. Um, but there is one aspect of these that I think is pretty interesting. These plumes here, I've shown one of them in more detail. Um, and they have a strong temperature structure in them, and they're several kilometers high. And, uh, you know, if you're looking for life, this could be a place for uh, where microbial species could be pretty happy. Um, <coughs> the plume, the, the temperature in the plume ranges all the way from possibly 100 degrees centigrade or so in that neighborhood at the bottom to, you know, freezing and 10 or 20 degrees below zero centigrade at the top. And on Earth, we know there are microbial species that inhabit each of these sort of temperature zones. And they metabolize exotic uh, elements, you know, iron and manganese, sulfur. They don't necessarily need organic matter or oxygen. <coughs> so uh, that was my contribution to <laughs> life in the universe. Um, and I guess there are, well, there's just some examples of some of the microbes that uh, have been found in exotic places on Earth, like Paracoccus furiosus. I mean, it it's, has to have a really hot environment. It freezes to death when it gets below 70 degrees C, which is pretty hot. Um, and Bacillus infernus, you know, from deep in the Earth. Um, interesting names. And also, they've been found in in sub to uh, to be able to metabolize in, in uh, sub-zero temperatures in in ice. Now, whether or not you could have microbes on Mars, of course, that's a big question, but they're extremely adaptable on Earth to all kinds of awful environments, hot, cold, highly acidic, highly basic, um, high salt concentrations. There's even a one that's radiodurans that's very resistant to radi radiation. Anyway, I did a little, one of the modules in the... Uh, Magnum code is a microbial species model. Um, this is a carryover from some of the environmental studies I've done for Earth-based uh, projects. And basically, it, it just says we can track the growth of microbial communities based on a monode kinetics for their dynamics, um, advection and diffusion of the microbial species. <coughs> Um, what I did essentially is set these time derivatives to zero. I want to find a steady state, neglect the diffusion, 
just look at evection and, and um, metabolism to get an idea of what, how large a community or how dense of a microbial community could you support in, a, in one of those convective plumes that the model said might exist on Mars. Um, and actually you end up with uh, you know, possibly uh, modest sized communities. Another aspect of the convection um, involves heterogeneity, because soils and rock on Earth are not uniform. Um, they have a lot of variability. You take a geologic unit and measure permeability and porosities, and they'll really bounce around you know, within that unit, even though it's supposedly a particular material. So I did a simulation or two with uh, basically generating a stochastic permeability field uh, with about an order of magnitude variation laterally in permeability at each, at each depth. Um, and here's one result, and it, it's, it says basically qualitatively it doesn't change things. Quantitatively it will. Um, in this image, it, which is with using a uniformly decreasing permeability with depth, um, well, that really washed out on the screen. It, uh, <coughs> well, there's a roll here and in a couple of plumes. This is the, the liquid water ice interface, and it's, you know, the whole system is 10 kilometers deep, 10 kilometers on a side, and this surface here is probably, uh, well, the minimum thickness there is one and a quarter kilometers below the surface. But with the heterogeneous solution, um, you actually get a thinner ice uh, shell in one spot. <coughs> the heterogeneity allows actually for a, a path to, to be created that's actually f highly, more highly permeable than the uh, average. Well, anyway, that's... Uh, Those are sort of fun things to do, but you know, we don't know if there's plumes like that in the subsurface of Mars, or if there's microbes growing in those plumes. And we also don't know how valid the solutions are. So we decided to carry out some experiments to try to test the, the model. Um, and most of the experiments were carried out by Dan Reisenfeld and Maureen McGraw when they were at the lab at Los Alamos. Um, <coughs> And the idea was to do a scale analysis and uh, carry out c convection with a cold surface um, with and without salts. Okay, the experimental setup is shown here, basically a fish tank of one and a half meters wide, half a meter tall, about 10 centimeters thick. Um, with a heat reservoir on the bottom to maintain a constant temperature, chillers on the top to maintain a sub-zero condition. And uh, then we put in, oh, well, lots of holes were drilled for thermistors, thermocouples, to get the uh, temperature measurements throughout the uh, domain. And the fish tank was filled with pea gravel. So we have a permeable medium heated from below with a freezing surface. Here's a picture of the final setup with all the uh, temperature gauges in place and um, heavily insulated on the outside. This thing's fairly narrow, so we have to worry about a lot of heat loss out through the, the faces. And there's probably a little bit of heat loss, but I, I think they did a pretty good job of minimizing it. And they had it um, hooked up to their computer so they could record temperature frequently over a period of many days. In the scale analysis, uh, we want the Rayleigh number of this little fish tank to be basically the same as what we think is appropriate for the Martian subsurface. Um, <coughs> and these, some of these numbers are guesstimates for, for Mars. Uh, 
You know, if it's 10 kilometers deep, the regolith, maybe there's 120 degrees C temperature drop across the, from the surface down to 10 kilometers depth. Um, and we end up with a Rayleigh number of something like 320 or so. And um, we can adjust some of the parameters in the experiment to get near that value. But really about the only thing we can control is the permeability, because fluid properties are fluid properties. But we were able to get pretty close to the uh, number for, for Mars. Not only for um, really deep systems as we were looking at with the simulations for pure water, but also for very shallow systems with brines. Because there, if H times dt is constant, uh, you could have 50 meters and a quarter of a degree C drop. So um, <coughs> dynamically, they should be similar. Okay, some of our simulations, um, just to get some idea of what to expect. And with these properties that the model predicts, uh, you get these uh, plumes coming off the bottom and have an ice water interface here. So some of the experimental results. Um, and here's a snapshot from the experiment at a particular time. This is pure water. And then we use this as initial conditions in the simulation and run the simulation forward while the experiment's running forward and then compare to see um, how they've evolved. And they're, they're not too bad. We think the reason this is not quite as intense is because of some heat loss through the faces of the fish tank. <coughs> uh, additional comparisons between um, experiment and model, experiment and model, snapshots taken at different times. In these cases, we had a warm surface uh, just to kind of explore all the all the parameter space. And I've got a little movie here. Um, now this is the pure water experiment. If I can get it back. So it's 50 centimeters deep and we're looking at the innermost 100 centimeters of width and uh, <coughs> the bottom temperature is almost constant. It's about 23, 24, 25 degrees centigrade. And the surface is getting colder. It's about minus 20 degrees centigrade. And you can see well-developed plumes have indeed formed. And they uh, tend to, to migrate or to oscillate a little bit over time. <coughs> and this line here is the uh, interface between liquid and, and frozen soil. So we do get features that look like what the numerical model was predicting. What's the vertical scale? What units? Centimeters? Centimeters. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Now for brine convection, uh, the Rayleigh number um, has to be modified because now we have two sources of buoyancy. When it's thermal buoyancy, if the bottom is hot, the fluid density decreases and fluid wants to rise. Um, chemical buoyancy, <coughs> in this case with the salts, as the uh, fluid rises and gets, begins to, to freeze or to uh, go below zero, salt begins to precipitate out and you, you tend to concentrate the salt in the fluid that's, uh, that's still liquid. And so uh, that tends to make the top layer of the fluid heavy and it sinks. So now you've got two sources of, of motion, thermal buoyancy and a chemical buoyancy. And the uh, Rayleigh number definition now includes both of those, the thermal expansion coefficient and the temperature difference. Um, the derivative of the density with respect to salt concentration times the salt difference, or maximum salt difference in the, in the domain. 
And uh, let's see. Well, here's a graph of the eutectic, uh, the suppression of the freezing point for, different, for two different salts that were used in these experiments. Calcium chloride goes all the way down to minus 52. So if you start out with some solution up here that's got maybe 10% salt in it, and you lower the temperature, it's going to, the concentration won't change until you reach this curve at about minus 8 degrees. And then as the temperature decreases further, the concentration of the solution goes up as water precipitates out as ice. Another uh, important quantity that we needed is the viscosity of the salt mixtures at sub-zero temperatures down to the eutectic. So here, uh, Maureen and Dan measured the uh, viscosities for different uh, mol molarities and different temperatures all the way pretty close to the eutectic. And you can see there's roughly an order of magnitude increase in viscosity. The sol solutions get more sluggish. Okay, another little movie. This one's calcium chloride solution. And one thing you'll notice is that it now it's much more dynamic. There's a lot more um, action. The plumes tend not to, stand, to stay in one place. They move around. You get hot spots where plumes form and then migrate and merge into others. It's a very unsteady situation. Remember, this dy is dynamically similar to either a shallow regolith, where you have a very small temperature difference, or to the entire regolith. Okay, then here is a, a, a simulation with the calcium chloride, and you can see also the very strong time dependence. Well. You know, in the experiment, it's a little mis misleading because all that time dependence happens in a few days. But when we scale it up to Mars, to the regolith, now the time is, you know, it's a few million years we're talking about. If we're looking at, you know, the full uh, 10 kilometers of the, of the regolith. But in any case, dynamically, they're, they're looking very similar. Okay, and then next set of simulations are done looking at uh, a very shallow system. Um, <coughs> you know, with pingos and other structures, it looks like uh, if there are aquifers, they're probably going to be fairly close to the, to the surface, brine aquifers. And um, so <coughs> ran a, a set of simulations that were only 200 meters deep. Um, partly because I wasn't sure how far down these, uh, the ice would, would penetrate. So I wanted to have enough depth so that uh, we would get to a point where you had unfrozen liquid. An interesting thing about these simulations is that uh, you get these little chimneys. Now this is looking at uh, a model domain, 200 meters on a side. And, and filled with soil of about 35% porosity. Um, and the pores are filled, either, or filled with a salt solution. And the salt initially is at 25% concentration. It's fairly high. <coughs> but the surface here is very cold. It's minus 52 centigrade. And what's happening is fluid is moving up into these regions here. And coming back down into these eutectic chimneys. So we have ice being dumped, or being precipitated out of the solution up here, very close to the surface. And these uh, little eutectic chimneys return flow, very narrow flow channels coming down back into the liquid subsurface. And I ran a series of these with different uh, conditions. For example, if the Poor fluid has very little salt in it initially, like say 5%. You get this really um, multi-scale structure. 
get a lot of small scale cells up here, which the return flow are these brighter uh, streaks or channels. So there's flow coming up through here. You're getting a lot of ice precipitating. And then the return flow is eutectic, and it's down through these channels, which don't seem to actually reach all the way back. Some of these feed into a little cell here that feeds into this. So you get you have this hierarchy of small cells feeding into bigger ones, feeding into bigger ones. And you get pretty much the same kind of feature with 10% initial salt. When we go to 20%, it's beginning to uh, become sort of single scale. Have the uh, cold but completely liquid brine solution here, upflow through here, and then downflow in these chimneys. Now we start out my simulations from a random perturbation, so that's why sometimes these look kind of irregular. You know, if I did a nice regular perturbation uh, to initiate things, these would probably look more regular in their spacings. And uh, higher salt concentration, 25%. Now the, uh, the frozen part of the system is getting shallower. Uh, not as much ice is being precipitated out. And when we get to eutectic or almost eutectic solution, there's really uh, not a lot of ice. The ice lenses are bigger, um, and the return channels are very broad. And there's basically a frozen layer right here at the surface. Now that's all in 2D. Uh, well, let's see. OK, just looking at some of those simulations and averaging them horizontally. Um, you can see the temperature difference across these is pretty small, just two or three degrees centigrade for the most part. And that depends partly on the heat flux that we're assuming. Um, and these all end up at essentially eutectic solutions and a little bit of salt that may precipitate out. OK, I also ran some three-dimensional simulations. Um, now this is one with uh, high initial salt content. And so here we have our 200 meter domain full of Martian soil. Um, <coughs> have a heat flux through the bottom and a cold surface temperature. <coughs> and you see that, uh, well, you can't see the flow coming up here, but it comes up and um, kind of mushrooms into these little ice lenses. And then the return flow is down along the edges. And these lenses are, you know, 50, 60 percent ice saturation in the pores, and they're within a few meters of the surface. And I was really happy to see that because it made me think of Bern et al.'s um, findings of, you know, ice being exposed by in small meteor impacts just a meter or two below the surface. Um, now, if we go to a case where the salt in the pores is very low to begin with. You get a really kind of bizarre looking thing. This is basically the 3D version of those 2D uh, multi-scale structures. Uh, once again, heat flow through the bottom. There's a brine solution in the pores. It moves up around all these narrow pencil thin columns, dumps ice out of here at the surface as a bunch of little lumpy lenses just a few meters in diameter. And then a return flow in these very narrow chimneys. And it's a multi-scale structure because you see some of these chimneys forming at different depths. Very interesting. Uh, one thing we'd like to do is run some experiments to see if you actually, if this sort of thing happens in the, in the lab. But there's a little problem of funding that uh, keeps popping up. <laughs> um. And another uh, adjunct to this is surface deformation. If you have um, a soil system that freezes, the ice is going to shrink, basically. It's about a 9 or 10% volume change. And if we assume that that led to um, 
slumping of the surface, then uh, we could calculate um, basically a surface deformation that would result from our uh, convective patterns. So this is basically the change in elevation of the surface depends on the ice content and the porosity and the difference in density between water and ice. I mean, in reality, there would be stress um, variations to consider, stress strain relations, but this would sort of give you an upper bound on what might happen. Some of the two-dimensional simulations. Um, you see roughly a, a foot of difference between centers of the, um, over the ice lenses and uh, in the troughs. And that's fairly typical for the various cases that I looked at. And I looked at probably a couple dozen cases. Um, some of these are a little bit deeper. Well, actually, the one that's deepest is the one that has the low salt concentration and you have those very, very thin return flow chimneys. <coughs> and you don't get very many pits or, or uh, depressions, but when you do, they can be very deep. And these are the uh, surface elevations over those two three-dimensional simulations that I showed you. So we have these elevated centers surrounded by um, troughs that are about close to a foot deep. Whereas in the um, low salt case, we basically just get a bunch of pits. And a um, few of us are looking at uh, some of the pattern ground that's been seen on Mars. And we can do some more simulations to see if we can relate um, the size and features of these of this pattern ground to brine convection or brine dynamics. And I've focused a lot on brine and convection, convective processes, but some of these could just simply be due to lakes or outflows that flooded an area and then finally and it seeped into the subsurface. Uh, and while they were seeping in, they were going through some interesting dynamics. And here in this picture, you can actually see little, little rocks, boulders, that tend to accumulate in the, uh, in the troughs around these polygons. So um, basically, the result of all these simulations and experiments indicate, to me anyway, that yeah, you could probably have briny aquifers convecting under Martian conditions, and I uh, might even be able to relate them to some of the surface features that, we've, that we see. And I don't think there's going to be time to go into any of these, but let me just briefly mention some of the other um, applications of a magnum. Um, besides these brine simulations that we've uh, carried out, um, Charlie Barnhart, when he was a PhD student under Francis Nimmo, used the code to look at impact craters, hydrological systems associated with impact craters in which there was freezing. Um, as I mentioned, we have also have a spherical geometry version of the code with the ocean layer and an ice shell, and we've been looking at uh, dynamics and asteroids and planetesimals because you know, early in their history, they were probably warm from decay of aluminum-26 and iron-60. There's enough energy to um, thaw the ice that uh, they would have contained, and for a few million years, they would have been warm and convect, <laughs> even with a very weak gravity, which is also another feature that we have. Gravity is 
computed every time step, um, so it can vary radially. <coughs> and uh, Phil Bland is real interested in using the code. We've put in particles so we can look at uh, dirty snowballs, you know, which are more ice and, and water than, than rock. And they're probably just lots of little particles. And as the uh, radio radioactive elements decay, the heat up, and the ice starts melting, and the particles could fall into towards the center. Basically, looking at differentiation in these bodies. And uh, we've done some work with water moons, Europa and Enceladus. Um, and these are these have been uh, whole moon simulations where we basically our whole history, thermal history, we start at the beginning of the moon and, and go forward with its thermal evolution. Trying to see, especially for Enceladus, under what conditions you might be able to keep it warm and liquid in the interior even to the present time. <coughs> And experimental work, uh, we'd sure like to be able to continue that, but uh, you know, with all the government cuts and sequestration, they pretty much had to give up on that. Um, and we've also used it for some terrestrial studies, looking at dike intrusions and mineral texture evolution associated with, uh, with magma intrusions and talic formation for <laughs> Arctic uh, lakes. I could go on for a few more hours, but I'm sure you don't want me to. <laughs> so I'll end it there. Thank you, Brian. I get the privilege of the first question. Sure. And that is, uh, the heating you have is from below. Is that necessarily the right model for a place like Europa or Enceladus heated by tidal effects? Or does that matter? No, that's only for Mars. For Enceladus and Europa, um, they're basically they have radio radioactive heating, radiogenic heating in the solid core. Um, Not for Europa and Enceladus. They're tidally heated. No, uh, but I mean, yeah, in the, t in the ice shell, there's tidal heating. But in the there's also radiogenic heating in the in the rocky core. <laughs> But my question was, do you have to worry about the distribution of those heat sources in doing your kind of calculation or simulation? Sure. But we do. Uh, we do. <laughs> I mean, the Rocky core has um, radiogenic elements in it. And the, the uh, ice shell has tidal dissipative heating. And that depends on the thickness of the ice shell and also the temperature of the ice shell. And probably the salt content, which I don't know if anybody's figured out how to deal with. Um, yeah, and then of course the ocean model. So uh, Mars question over here. Mm. Hi. Uh, so you showed some pictures of, of the surface features, but one of the uh, things that we see in orbit on the, on the surface of Mars are uh, liquid or, or looks like the remains of liquid flows mm -hmm. that have happened and there's some debate as you know some people say well it's water some say it's liquid uh, carbon dioxide whatever um, I was wondering if these brine chimneys might provide a mechanism for bursting through the surface with temporary flows that could account for some of the things we see from satellites and if so could the viscosity model maybe support or refute that Yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> the, uh, some of our simulations, well, actually in the experiments with calcium chloride, I don't know if you noticed or not, but actually the, in the corners above some of the plumes, you actually would have breached the surface if, if there hadn't been a plate there you know, for the chiller. Even though the whole surface was supposedly kept at minus 20, there was so much heat coming up that it would have actually gone, gone through. Yeah, so I think that's certainly plausible. And the, the, uh, you know, the brine viscosity would be maybe 10 times higher than liquid water, so it would be kind of sluggish, but I don't think it would be molasses. You know, it would be a liquid that could flow. <coughs> <coughs>
as he stated, the source of these uh, uh, flows are, are uncertain, and one theory is they're entrained ice from the last large obliquity of Mars. But in fact, yes, uh, this would be an attractive way of another mechanism for them to sample subsurface water. Mm -hmm. And that gets me to my question is, they're thought to be very briny from what they can see. They leave these white trails down the side of the valley. If I'm correct in reading your model, any water that does break to the surface is going to be more briny than the subsurface aquifer as a whole, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. It'd probably be eutectic right at the maximum concentration. Um, I <clears throat> Uh, my question has to do with the, the source of the heat, uh, geo or marzo thermal heat. Um, how much of that is radioactive decay? Um, probably an awful lot of it. I mean, there are estimates at um, you know, 30 milliwatts per square meter. That's sort of the global average for Mars, although, you know, give or take. 50% depending on who you talk to. But it'll be higher in some regions than others, especially if, you know, like maybe in a Tharsis bulge where there's volcanic activity, it might, might be higher. It was certainly a lot higher in the past. And here. So what would the flow rate be on these uh, cycle and the plumes in particular? I'm thinking if it breaks through the surface, is it going to look like a brine spring or more like a seep? Um, that's a good question. I mean, the, the range of velocities varies quite a bit depending on conditions. But it would probably be a seep unless you really had a, a little fracture or something that was coming right up and, or a pressurized system. Mm, probably not. <laughs> so the, uh, the diagrams you were showing, the results of your simulations, had an awful lot of detail in them. I'm wondering what, uh, um, how many divisions you had over your uh, total volume. So how many data points were you computing? Um, for the 3D simulations, it's a few million. And how long did it take to run? Uh, you don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I have a computer on my desk that just runs. It's got several processors, and I let it run for a few weeks. Any other questions? It's a very stable computer system. <laughs> well, thank you very much again, and uh, we appreciate your coming to visit us.